let's talk about heteroscedasticity and we'll talk about an example that uh, has come up just recently for Brent Edelman, who's in the PhD program and is writing his dissertation, and one of the things that he is uh, interested in is the impact of cultural diversity on on uh, school outcomes. And one of the pro he can he can obtain data at the school level, but not at the student at the level of the individual student. So this thing we're going to talk about now would be germane to him. <coughs> Suppose that we have a cross-section data set. You know what that is. So I have all my observations are on different individuals at a point in time. So there's no time component to it. I looked at everybody in the room at a point in time. This time what we're going to do is we're going to assume that while the error covariance matrix is still diagonal, it's not scalar diagonal. That is to say, the expected value of UU transpose, I don't know what happened to the Subscript should be 1 from n. So it's lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. Yeah. So that the error covariance matrix is no longer scalar diagonal. So one way to correct for that, given what we know about uh, generalized mixed squares from earlier, is we'll construct a new matrix that we'll call P inverse. And we're going to make P inverse be on the main diagonal, the square root of lambda 1, square root of lambda 2, all the way through the square root of lambda n, down to the last row, last column. And then our observation is that P inverse transpose times P inverse gives us omega inverse. So there was omega, and this times itself gives us the inverse of omega. And we know that the uh, best linear unbiased estimator when we have a, an error covariance matrix that's not scalar diagonal is X transpose omega inverse X quantity inverse times x transpose omega inverse y. And now we have a way to model omega inverse, given what we know about the error covariance thing. So let's look at a particular example. Suppose that we have some data, or we, we would like to have some data. We would like to be able to see, for example, test scores for each individual student and that student's parental income. Some, for some reason, we think there's a connection between the two. And so in the best of all possible worlds, we would be able to observe that data. But in this country, there's a uh, problem with that. It violates an individual's right to privacy to have their identity known in that way. So instead, the only data that we get is the average score in a particular school. We know how many kids are in the school, and we know what the average score of the students is in the school. And we know what the average income is of the parents who have children in that school. So instead of seeing little QIJ and XIJ, instead we see the average of Q for the J school. So if NJ is the number of kids in the J school, then the average test score in that school is the sum of the QIJ, where the index I runs from 1 to the number of kids in the J school. So J is the index of the school. And we sum out the index over the children. And we do the same thing with income. And uh, we'll call those means uh, big Q. And we do the same thing with income. We have to take average parental income. And so the model, the model we're really working with is this one. It's stated in terms of the average test score in the school and average parental income in the school. The question is whether or not we're doing much violence to the truth by using that kind of aggregated data. So the question is, what's the behavior of Oh, even if we disregard what's going on with the error term, the least squares estimator of beta, the marginal effect of an extra dollar of income on children's outcomes, we can still estimate that unbiasedly. The question is whether or not the, the way in which we've aggregated the data then is whether or not it has an impact on the efficiency of the estimator that we're using. Is least squares this plain old garden variety of these squares applied to the aggregate data are going to be efficient. We know that it's unbiased. That's a simple proof that we can do. It takes about 33 seconds. Uh, but the question is, by ignoring the information of the error term, or about the error term, have we lost some statistical efficiency? The answer is yes. We already know that from something we did in here two weeks ago. Uh, so we need to look more closely at the error term. So the error term in the aggregated model is a big UJ which is the average of the disturbances for each and every student in the J school. And 
So now we're interested in the covariance, or the variance and the covariance of this error term, big UJ, and big U some other index. So we're interested in the variance of the mean error in the school. So it's the variance of that linear combination, which we know to be uh, sum of variances times 1 over nj squared. <coughs> so now we have a perfect example like the one I started with. What I started with was an example where the error covariance matrix differed down the diagonal. And now we have a specific example where the multiplicative term doesn't change as we go down the diagonal, but the nj term has changed as we go down the diagonal. So our efficient estimator is going to make use of of that knowledge. And the transpose is on the wrong view here. It would be the correct value of the transpose. So the true, uh, when we're using the aggregate data, the error covariance matrix has sigma squared on the main diagonal, but in the denominator, changes as you go down the diagonal, because the schools are of different sizes. So we need to, given what we do know, we can construct the inverse of the square root of the error covariance matrix and transform the model. We <coughs> construct a Q tilde, which is P inverse, times the original data. X tilde, which is P inverse, the known structure of the error covariance matrix, times X. And implicitly, there's a U tilde as well. And then, when we apply least squares to the transformed data, we get X tilde transpose X tilde inverse, X tilde transpose Q tilde. And that is not the garden variety of least squares estimator. That's the, the Aitken estimator. That's the efficient estimator. Both least squares and beta, this beta hat, beta tilde. This one is the blue estimator. Applying just straight OLS to the aggregated data would not be blue. So what's the moral of the story? If you're doing a research paper or research project with cross-section data, you almost certainly have a heteroscedasticity problem. Sometimes it was built in by virtue of the way the data was assembled, and sometimes it's inherent in the economic agents themselves. There is not only the science of econometrics, which is proving the Gauss-Markov theorem, or proving that uh, the error covariance matrix is not scalar diagonal, and there's a better estimator than just the squares, and so on and so forth. That's the science part. The question was, what do I do about it? If I have a cross-section study, what do I do about it? How do I know how to deal with the heteroscedasticity? So I can tell you, I can give you some examples. It's a common example to, for example, if you thought that um, the variance of the error term depended in some way on firm size, and you have a cross-section of firms, then you would weight the data by the inverse of the square root of firm size. And that was similar to what we did with schools. Okay. So that's one way to do it. So it's a judgment thing. Or I suppose you could, is it possible you can just pick the uh, variance covariance matrix that has a uh, the linear model that has a variance matrix where it is uh, different numbers on each cell with diagonal. Yeah, but that's by by reweighting your data, for example, by firm size or level of employment. That would be a way for account, account of doing that explicitly. Nobody's going to give you data where they've already done that for you. Right. So your job is to figure out exactly how you're going to do it. <coughs> So in studies of firms, they do things like rescale by the inverse of the square root of employment in the firm. And by construction, then, if the main diagonal of the error covariance matrix was not scalar diagonal, by and it depended on employment, by virtue of what you did to rescale the data, you coerced it to become scalar diagonal. So in your coerced data, you constructed a scalar diagonal covariance matrix.